morning a servant's prayer. A servant's prayer. Um, just, a, just a simple word from God this morning, but I believe a powerful word from God this morning. I've been seeking God all week, been praying all week, and I'm ready to go this morning. So I pray your heart and your mind is, uh, is excited and is ready to go and ready to hear the word as I am to preach it this morning. But um, if you would, when you find your place in John chapter 6, just stand in honor of reverence to reading God's word this morning. John 6, 26 is where we're going to start. We're going to go through 36. We're going to read 10 verses this morning. And so this is Jesus speaking. When you see those words written in red, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, that's Jesus speaking. And so you see where it's kind of scattered throughout these verses through verse 36. But Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him who, um, whom he, he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign show us thou then that we may see and believe thee, and what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us his bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I say unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. Father, we love you, we thank you, we praise you for loving us, God. I thank you for this wonderful crowd here today. I pray for those who are sick and aren't able to be here, God, or may be out of town. I pray you keep them safe and bring them back home to our church family safely. But, Father, for all of us here today, God, I just pray for a word from heaven. I pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts and our mind. I pray you'd bring revival, God. I pray you'd change and revolutionize the way we think through hearing from your word, through your spirit dealing with our hearts today. God, we just want you to be praised and uplifted. We want your mighty name to be proclaimed. And it's in Jesus' name, that beautiful, wonderful name that I do pray. Amen. All right, so I've been talking about prayer and different things that can hinder you from having a great prayer life and different things that you could do to have a great prayer life. You know, I've talked about all kinds of things. I've talked about hate. I've talked about all kinds of other things. And, you know, one thing that I took kind of a break from that last week when I preached last Sunday, but one of the things that I said last week in the sermon was that we just, the answer to a lot of things is we just need to be to church. You know, we just need to be to church. So here you have these people talking, they're talking to Jesus they have been fed, you know, whenever Jesus fed the 5,000. So they'd seen a miracle, they'd ate. And now, you know, they're talking about, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So here you have them, they're very interested in what God is doing. They're very interested in what's going on, or it sounds like it anyway. And then Jesus starts talking to them, you know, and he starts telling them the things that they need to do. And he told them, you know, he said, this is the work of God that you believe on him who has sent. And then you get on down there to verse 36. And it says, but I said unto you, and this is Jesus talking, that you also have seen me and believe not. Now, I mean, when you look at these verses, it's kind of troubling that Jesus had this long monologue, this long conversation with these people, and it ended there. It ended when he said, but I said unto you, that you also have seen me and believe not. That's troubling. That's troubling that they may have eaten from, uh, you know, the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. It's troubling that they may have seen the works of God, and yet they believe not. You understand what I'm saying? It, it's very troubling that you could see people that were very close to God and understood God and knew that he was God, yet they didn't believe, they didn't trust. And not to say that they didn't believe the miracles that they seen, but saying they didn't believe, they didn't trust in him. We need to trust in him. And so this morning, the title of the sermon is A Servant's Prayer. And the thing that I'm going to talk about that will hinder you from having a great prayer life, and this is one that many of you may um, not like to hear, but one of the things that will hinder you and keep you from having a great prayer life is you, you need to be serving. Your lack of serving God is hindering you from having a great prayer life. If you're not serving God this morning, you don't have a great prayer life. I'm telling you, you don't. It's not what it could be. Listen, I'm just going to tell you something straight. I'm just going to come right out the gate wide open. You know how sometimes you see these races and, and they'll pace themselves. They got the jockey and they tell the jockey when they, when the, when they got one of those thoroughbred, you know, quarter of a million, million dollar horses, my, um, my wife's uncle, he goes up there and he takes care of them horses. He, 
He does all kind of things up there in Kentucky. He goes up there for a couple of months. He actually just went up there to work at one of those stables just last month. But, you know, they'll pace that. They'll pace that thoroughbred so that he can run hard at the end of the gate. Well, I'm just going to do a little quarter horsing this morning. You know what I mean? I had, I had, a, I had a big thigh. That ain't a negative thing with a horse either, ladies. Don't be getting mad at me now. But I had a big thigh quarter horse, and she could roll right off the gate. And her name was Jessie, and she could fly. And I love to take off with her. And that's just how I'm going to roll this morning. But listen to me. If you're not serving God, you can't have a great prayer life. You just can't. You just can't. You know, and, and you say you believe and you trust God, but you don't if you're not serving. You just flat out don't. And it's just not going to work. And there's no way around it. I mean, honestly, I could seriously stop right there. You can feel the Holy Spirit moving in this place today. I know there's people convicted by what I just said. And you're sitting here convicted by what I already said. Some of you may still be arguing in your mind with me. You can argue all you want with me. But you can't argue with God. You need to be serving God to have a great prayer life. Your prayer life is going to be hindered until you start serving God. That's just all there is to it. You know, I, I think about, one of the things I think about, and um, we're going to pray for Matthew before we leave here today because Matthew's going to be going on a mission trip. And one of the things I thought of, and Cody, we done prayed for Cody. We're going to pray for Cody again. He's going to be going on a mission trip too, amen? I'm telling you, he's going in a dangerous place too. But I can tell you, just thinking about praying for Matthew has helped me to just think about last year whenever I went to Mexico on a mission trip. i tell you something that happened to old Greg. I ain't never been scared of anything. But you know what I'm saying? I got to thinking about all the things that happen when I'm going to a whole other country. And, you know, it, it, might be, it might be something, it might be one way for some of you that are real pale skin and you're blonde-headed and you're blue-eyed, but I kind of got dark hair, and, you know, when I get some sun, I get real dark skin, and I was thinking they might think I belong here and keep me. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, I seriously thought, I thought about all those kind of things. You think about anything and everything, and let me tell you something that happens when you go to do something like that. When you go to do something like that, you, you just, your prayer life just goes through the roof. Now, there's some of you in here this morning, you, you, you're shy people. You're shy people, but what if God just come to you and spoke to you tonight? I mean, and he'd, he'd never spoken to me in an audible voice, but say, he went and spoke to one of you shy people in an audible voice, and he said, you know what? I want you to, I want you to speak to the whole church next week and tell them something. You know what you would do? You would be on your knees praying every day that God help you before you had to get out here and speak. There's some of you in here today, if, if, if everybody got the, got the flu and you was the only person left, and, and you know, with that flu, they got a strep throat, nobody else could speak, you was the only person here in the Sunday school hour who had a voice left, and you was going to have to teach a Sunday school lesson. I guarantee you, you start praying right then, your prayer life would increase. You might not have prayed this morning before you come to Sunday school. Heck, you might not have even got up and been at Sunday school this morning. But you'd be praying then. You understand what I'm telling you? That's what I'm trying to say is when you start serving God, you naturally, your prayer life goes through the roof. See, but the thing that you think about is, the thing that you worry about is, you, you think about, you know, all the great, mighty things that could happen. These people right here, they were worried about a sign. All they wanted to do, they wanted to see some big sign. They wanted to have some big thing happen to them. They wanted something for themselves. They were doing it in a selfish way. Let me tell you something. Man, I tell you what, you need to be thinking about how you can serve God, and you need to quit, I'm telling you right now, you need to quit thinking you're better than everybody else. You may not think that you think you're better than everybody else, but let me just ask you a question right now. Who do you think you are to sit in here in a body where we're all supposed to work together and not do nothing and everybody else do something? If that's not elitist, I don't know what is. It's like, it's like people that are, are, receiving, are receiving help from people or help from the government and, you know, they're not grateful for it. They think, oh, you know, you know they just don't care. They got a bad attitude about it. Then you have other people, they're born into families, that have money they never had to work in their life. They have a bad attitude about things. I don't care if you're rich or you're poor this morning. I don't care who you are. You can get an elitist attitude about church. Sitting there thinking, you're be how are you any better than me? I don't care if God told me to carry out the trash, to, to scrub the toilets with a toothbrush. I don't care if He told me to go. I've come up here some Sundays. And I'll tell you right now, I'll tell you right now, if we don't get those trash can lids shut down, 
There is a pack of rabid dogs that Miss Tiny used to have at her house that she pulled over here and dropped off. <laughs> that go around and tear every piece of garbage up in that whole trash can. And I come out here on Sunday morning after we had something, or in, in the whole place, there's trash, there's y'all. I mean, were some of you slobbered on your fork? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, everything you can imagine is laying out there. And you know what I do? I get out of my car, and I go get a trash can, and I pick it up. You know why? Because I'm a servant of God. Because I don't care what God tells me to do or what i got to do. I'm not too good to do it. But there are actually people in church who have an elitist attitude and feel like they can come and partake in everything and have a right not to do nothing. Why? I mean, you're not better than any of us. You're a servant just like us. There was a saying when I worked out there at the mill. See, listen here. I'm telling you right now, Morgan so gets this right here. I had a blue hat when I first started. Everybody that worked on the clock had a blue hat. And you know what they told me? They said, the people that are in management, they have white hats. And you know what? So sometimes what would happen was, some, hey, especially when you got some young pumpkin that thought he knew everything, you know? He would come try to tell you, another blue hat, what you needed to do. And I would say, <clears throat> hey, look at your hat. Is your hat white? They say, no, it ain't. Well, it don't tell me what to do. You ain't no better than me. You got a blue hat. And that's what I'm saying. In God's house, I don't care if it's a preacher. I don't care if it's a deacon. I don't care if it's a Sunday school teacher. I don't care if you're the 46,000th generation that founded this church and dug out the hole for the footer to be buried and put on. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are around town. I don't care your social status. It doesn't matter. In God's house, we all got blue hats. Amen? The only thing, the only person that needs to get bowed down to in God's house is God's Son. He's the one He put on the right hand of Him in heaven in a place where He said the earth was His footstool. He's the one that one day, I don't give a rip what every atheist, what every overeducated, I'm telling you what, God ignorant person in the world says, He's the one that every day, every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess. And so I don't give a rip who you are in God's house this morning. You ain't no better than any of the rest of us. The best thing you can do to improve your prayer life, and if you want to have a real prayer life, is to get to work doing something, whatever it is God called you to do in God's house. Amen? Amen. Now I'm fixing to get to a real complicated part of the sermon, okay? So pay attention. I ask this question. What does a servant's prayer look like and sound like and consist of? All right, it's two very complicated things. To have a servant's prayer and to pray a servant's prayer, you need two things. You need a servant. That's the complicated first part. And the second part is, you need a prayer. That's it. That's it. That's it. You want to hear from heaven? You want God to pour His Spirit into you and pour it out into a world? You want to see miraculous things happen? Be a servant of God. Point number one. And pray. Point number two. See, one reason you're able to function without your prayer life right now being great, and it really doesn't bother you that your prayer life is not great, is because you're doing the same thing, you're living the same way you were living before you ever even came to Christ. You don't need Jesus to live like a hell. You. Matter of fact, God ain't going to help you to do it. You don't need Jesus to walk around pride bowed up with your nose up. You don't need Jesus for any of those things you were doing before you came to Him. You could do that in your own strength, in your own flesh. But see, if you are radically changed, if you've been born again, and you want to live as a child of God with the standard of the Word of God, not comparing yourself to your, to your neighbor over there laying drunk in the ditch or the one that down the road that beats his wife when you quit comparing yourself to them, if you really want to live like God and compare yourself to Jesus Christ and you want to live to His standard, then you're going to need a radical prayer life. Then you're going to need a real prayer life. Then you're going to need, really need God's power because you can't function in a Christian way and live a Christian life without Christ. Amen? I'm telling you, you can't do it in your own strength. But now if you're satisfied with living like, just like the rest of the world and you're happy living just like the rest of the world and you're sitting there and your lips poking out right now, some of your lips poking out. It's poking out. 
I mean, you, you got, I, I don't know your family tree line, but you got to have some Carter in you somewhere. They say me and my daddy are terrible. You know when I'm mad, my lip's sticking out about that far. And they ain't even but that long. But listen to me. You, you sitting there with your lip poked out because I'm, I'm just telling you the dead truth. You out there living just like the world, so you don't need a great prayer life. You're not trying to serve God. You're not trying to do things that only God can do. That's what God calls His children to do, to do godly things. And the godly things, the God-led things, the God-dream things, only God can do. And you can only do it with His strength. You can only do it with His power. And then, so you've got to get on your knees and admit that you can't do it in yourself and ask God for help. But you're not getting on your knees and you're not asking God for help because you're not trying to do godly things. And then you look at these people right here in this story and you wonder, what is it going to take? And you look around in the church and you wonder, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for people that aren't serving God who say they're children of God? See, when they started talking about wanting to do the wondrous works, Jesus just caught them at the place that it really was at and that was in their belief. That was in their faith. That was in their trust. There was another guy. There was this guy named Naaman. You can turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5 if you want to. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria. This was not a Israelite. This was not a man following God, okay? That's just, a, that's just an easy, simple way of saying this. This wasn't a man following God, but this was a man in need. A captain of the host of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance into Syria. He was also a mighty man in battle, but he was a leper. So he's a great soldier. He was high up in social status, but he was a leper. If you don't know something about leprosy, it's, it's worse than the plague, man. Nobody could, you could be around nobody. Nobody wanted to be around you. It was highly contagious. It looked ugly. Parts of your body would fall off. I mean, literally, it's like being a zombie type person. I mean, that's what it reminds me of, these modern-day movies where they have zombies. Just pieces falling off of him, skin looked all crazy. Nobody wants to be around somebody like that. I mean, if you cough hard, three people move on down from you. You go into the doctor's office and they tell you to put on a mask. You're scared to death, you know? This guy had leprosy. So listen, it says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So listen to how this all got hooked up. And she said unto her mistress, Will God my Lord wear the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is in the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, ten chains of rent. He brought a lot of money and a lot of stuff. And the king of and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is coming to thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive? The king of Israel got scared because he was thinking, All right, this guy, this king from Syria has sent this, his servant that he loved with all his heart. He sent all this money. If he sent all these people, he went through this trouble. He loves his servant who's got leprosy. And he sent him to me to get him healed. And he's thinking, how can I heal a guy of leprosy, you know? He's saying, now this king's going to get mad with me and come try to kill us all. So he was all upset. He was all worried. He was all bothered by it. But look what went on. It says, that this man sent unto me to recover this man of leprosy. Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh to quarrel against me. He thought he was just sending him to a reason for him to go fight with him. But look what it goes on. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door in the house of Elijah. And it says, And Elijah sent a messenger unto him. Elijah is the prophet of God. He's the man of God who had performed many miracles. He ended up performing like 32 miracles, I think is what Elijah performed. So he performed these great miracles, including raising somebody from the dead. So he was a great man of power with God. All right? And so look what it says. Elijah sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth. This guy who left, he got mad. He was wroth. Look what it says. It says, but Naaman was wroth and went away. He left. He could have been healed. This great man of God with the power of God told him how he could be healed, but he got mad and left. He stomped out. He went away. And he said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God. 
and struck his hand over the place and recovered the leper. First thing he got mad about was that the man of God didn't even come out to talk to him. He thought he was such a high-ranking man that that man of God should have stopped what he was doing. Whatever it was, whoever else it was he might have been helping, whatever it was God had told him to do, he should have stopped what he was doing, went out there and talked to Naaman to start with, probably bowed to him, said hey to him, whatever, and he should have done it right then and there. He thought, man, don't I deserve that? But listen to what he goes on to say. And he said, but Naaman was wroth, he left, you know, and struck his hand over the place, recovered the leper. Are not Abna and Parfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and he went in a way of rage. So first he was mad because the man of God didn't come out himself and talk to him. Secondly, he got mad because he told him to go wash in the Jordan River, which was a lot dirtier river than those other rivers. It was known for being dirty. And so he said, you know what? You sent me down here in the mud hole to be cleansed of leprosy. Why couldn't you have sent me to a better place? See, y'all already know where this is going, don't you? Look what he says. And his servants came near and spake to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing. Here we come to just, this just what I'm preaching about this morning, ain't it? If the prophet had told you to do, do, went and done some great thing, you know, if he had told him to go conquer this country over here, if he had told him to go beat this greatest warrior in battle, if he had told uh, Naaman to, to go do some great thing, look what he says. He said, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he said that he washed and be clean? Then went he down. Thank God for his servants. Look what he says. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So not only did he get healed, but his flesh was like that of a little child. See, you ladies in here, you ain't even catching this. I thought y'all would get a hold of this. Now, there's some of you are going to buy you a plane ticket to Israel so you can go jump in the Jordan River and all your wrinkles go away. <laughs> See, you're just now hitting what I'm talking about now, ain't you? I mean, you spend all this money on, on, uh, on all this health care products and skin care products. This man went and got in the dirty river. So see, what you need to do is just take your husband fishing more often. Jump in the river while you're there. <laughs> But verse 14 again, look what it says. It says, according to the saying of the man of God. Now, I know I'm not Elijah. But look what it says. According to the saying of the man of God. But I'm standing here this morning as God's servant, as God's messenger. And I may just be some country preacher. You know, there's churches out there that they won't take a preacher unless he's got a Ph.D. You know, I don't want them to take me anyway. Amen? And they some, hey, they, let me just tell you something. You know what I mean? And they some preachers that wouldn't come and preach in some country church somewhere out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of hick, but praise God, I'm a hick too. And I love being here. Amen? And he can just keep himself, his prideful self down the road. We don't care about having that man down at Walkerville. Amen? I'll take Buddy Grinder any day over that sap sucker. I'm just telling you straight up. Man out there plucking and killing his own chickens, man. He can get it done. Amen. Ain't even got to go to KFC. You know, but I'm just here to tell you this morning, I may not be Elijah, but I'm a man of God with the message of God this morning, and I'm telling you the straight truth that you cannot have a great prayer life. You're never going to get anywhere with your prayer life until you start serving God. Until you start serving God. And you know what? You know what? I get sick and tired of it. And I'm telling you, I know God gets sick and tired of it. I know He gets sick and tired of it. People just flat out lying to you. Just flat out lying to you. You understand what I'm saying? They say, Brother Greg, and you, you come down here. I'll preach about this and you'll be feeling just so... Some people in here, you know what I mean? They aren't just as sweet like you, Hannah. They've never done nothing wrong in their life. Just as sweet as she can be. Some of them are in here mean as junkyard dogs. But even sometimes mean as junkyard dogs. You get to preaching to them, they're feeling guilty. They get to feeling guilty because they're sitting around today. And they're thinking, man, look at all these people right here. They know I ain't hitting a lick of a snake in this church. You know what I'm saying? They see my hand go, I, they, they don't, I don't just like sit there when a tithe plate comes around. I stick my hands in my back pocket and sit on one of the tithe plates. Come around. You know, I mean, they're feeling guilty right now. So sometimes people in their guilt 
will feel guilty and they'll come and they'll tell God, they'll tell God all kind of lies. Some of you in here today, you don't tell, you don't know you done lied to the preacher before. Say, Brother Greg, I'm going to do better about this. You know, I'm ready to serve somewhere. But listen, you even went further than that before. You've lied to God before. Think about it. Think about it. You've done something like what somebody's done before. You know, and you may have even done it in a, in a, in a, even, I'm talking about an even more, you know, fantastic kind of way. You may have told the Lord, you know, Lord, I promise you this time, I crossed my heart and I hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. You ever heard that? You ever heard that? <laughs> listen, listen. Listen to this, listen to this poem I found. I love this poem. Liar, liar is the name of it, all right? <laughs> Liar, liar. And I'm not just preaching to you. I've been there before too. I've made promises to God and not kept them. But we need to take that seriously. Listen to what it says. Don't trust the word I say. I'm a liar. I swear. I lie in public. I lie at home. I lie so well it can't be fair. So don't trust me at all. I even lie to myself. I'll cross my heart and hope to die, but my fingers are crossed as well. You know what I mean? You come down, you ever done that? You ever come down to the altar? And promise God something and you were sitting there praying with your hands behind your back and your fingers crossed. Because you knew good and well when you got up from there you weren't going to be serving God. I'm going to tell you something today. I'm going to tell you about the power of the day. You don't understand what you got in your hands when you got the day. You don't understand the power of the day. You don't understand. You know, there, there's nothing you can do about yesterday. You have no power in yesterday. Oh, if I could, I would go back to yesterday. Oh, if I could, I'd go back to days and moments and times. And I'd put duct tape over my mouth. I would tie my hands. I would slash my tires so I couldn't go there. I would do so much in yesterday, but I have no power in yesterday. In my future, I have no promise of my future. I have no promise of tomorrow. But today, man, every one of us here today are breathing before Almighty God. Today, God has blessed you with a great, Mighty power in your hand. You have the power of the day. There's been days, listen to me, learn to say it with me, learn to say it with me. There's been days we've been selfish, but guess what? Not today, come on. There's been days we've been selfish, but what? Not today. There's been days that we've been lazy, but not today. There's been days that we've procrastinated, but not today. There's been days that we've lied to ourselves, that we've lied to God, that we've made promises we weren't going to keep, but not today. There's been days when some of you that have never been saved, that you've never felt the love of Jesus Christ, you've never had your sins forgiven, and the weight of your sins lifted from you every day you left church, every day you lived on the earth, you've lived that day headed to hell. But you know what you can leave this church saying today? If you'll bow your head and your heart, and you'll come down to this altar and repent of your sins, you can say, not today. I'm not headed to hell today. Amen. And they, some of you, they, some of you in here today, you've been worried, you've been worried about what people beside you thought. You've been afraid to come and get out of the altar and do business with God because of what people would say. But not today. Not today, man. Take and use the power of today because you're not promised tomorrow. There's nothing you can do about yesterday. Yesterday. 